Hi, I'm Amber Butchart, one of the hosts of Audible's Fashioned. I'm a fashion historian and my job involves researching clothes and understanding not just what we wore, but who we were and who we are today. I've written books about fashion, spoken at the Tate and the v and about it, and been on the BBC as well. But today I'm here to tell you about how back in the day your clothes may have cost more than your house, why Elizabeth I wanted to ban fashion altogether, and how some establishments even employed fashion spies. These are the rules of fashion. The rules of fashion today may be set by Instagram, magazines or couture catwalks, but in the past there were actual laws making certain clothing illegal. These were known as sumptuary laws, ruling over everything from the shortness of men's tunics so as to not expose their buttocks, to the pointedness of people's shoes to prevent them from falling over. Personally, I don't believe in many fashion rules when it comes to dressing. I think that rules are there to be broken. For example, blue and green should never be seen. I wear blue and green together loads. Or that old adage that you should take one thing off before you leave the house. I say put one more accessory on. More is always more. So what are sumptuary laws? Sumptuary laws were all about curtailing excess and extravagance from food to fashion on the basis that too much luxury must be bad for you and your pockets. Although the history of pockets is actually fascinating and I suggest you look into it. So why did these laws exist? One purpose behind these sumptuary laws was to try to control social hierarchies and morals through restrictions on clothing, food and luxury goods. Basically to try to keep people, especially women and the lower classes, in their place. They could also be used to bolster the production of certain materials and items, so as a kind of tool to take care of the economy. Controlling people's dress was key, because before the Industrial Revolution, dress was perhaps the most powerful marker of social identity. After all, there weren't many other ways in which you could tell people about yourself. No flashy cars to drive around just yet. So let's take a look at some examples. If you're struggling to imagine these in practice, let me take you back. It's the 1400s and Edward IV is on the throne. He passes a law that says no one below the level of a lord is allowed to wear purple silk. Now purple was expensive to produce and so it was a very clear marker of wealth. Lower ranked knights also had to pay up to £20 if they wore anything gold coloured or with sable fur. The thing is though, there isn't actually any evidence that offenders were even punished, but more on that later. Next we have Elizabeth I, who had a particular bee in her bejeweled bonnet about fashion. She issued a number of proclamations on the rules of fashion throughout her reign. Now this could have been to try and limit the rise of the merchant class, who were becoming wealthy and powerful but who lacked noble birth. With their new money they had the financial means to buy clothing intended for their social superiors, which just really wouldn't do according to Elizabeth. We also see these ideas around dress equaling identity reflected in Shakespeare. You may remember the line, apparel oft proclaims the man. This is from Hamlet. And in All's Well That Ends Well, we hear the soul of this man is his clothes. Things got so bad that at one point Elizabeth even attempted to ban fashion itself. Any new kind or form of apparel and garnishing thereof was to be punished. Now, although we might see this as horrifying, it might have actually been a blessing in disguise because new clothes were so expensive. In 1588, seven doublets and two cloaks owned by the Earl of Leicester were valued at £543. This made each item, on average, more than the price that Shakespeare had paid for a whole house. So Elizabeth tried to put a limit on this extravagance with a proclamation prohibiting monstrous and outrageous greatness of hose or shirts having double ruffs either at the collar or sleeves. She was basically saying your shirts are too frilly and your pants are too puffy. Ruffs around the neck were also reviled by the pamphleteer Philip Stubbs. In 1583, he described them brilliantly as these cartwheels of the devil's chariot of pride, leading the direct way to the dungeon of hell. 
The rules of fashion covered all sections of society. For example, take the 1571 Elizabethan Cap Act. This decreed that every male aged six and above who was not a gentleman had to wear a woolen cap, which could be known as a statute cap, every Sunday and on public holidays. Now, not only was this an effective way for the government to support the crucial wool trade, but it also marked the wearer out as a member of the lower class. If you didn't follow these stringent rules, you might even get rumbled by a fashion spy. Areas throughout the country, as well as universities, were directed to appoint four substantial and well-meaning men to snitch on those dressing above their station. So what were the penalties? During Elizabeth's rule, punishment could theoretically include confiscating the garment, three months in jail or fines of up to £10 a day. To put that in context, the National Archives currency converter has that at £2,045 in today's money, or 200 days wages for a skilled tradesman, or enough to buy five cows. Three days in the stocks was another possible punishment. However, in reality, the laws were hard to enforce and were largely ignored. And of course, forbidding certain styles probably made them even more desirable. The most regular offenders were usually the rich merchant classes or members of the nobility. Now, these were people with quite a lot of power, so there was some reluctance to punish them. It becomes clear in Elizabeth's later proclamations that her fashion laws had not been effective. And at this stage, she tries to double down on them. Her Majesty, finding by experience that by clemency, this increasing evil hath not been cured. Oh dear. One rare example of a punishment being carried out is the case of Thomas Bradshaw, a merchant tailor who had all the stuffing and lining of one of his hose cut and pulled out before being led through the streets to his home, where the same thing was done to his other leg. And we know just how monstrous and great those hose could be. The sumptuary laws were repealed in 1604, a year after James I became King of England. They were beginning to be seen as being broadly out of step with contemporary ideas around personal freedom. If these laws hadn't been abolished, we may not have the £26 billion fashion industry that we have today. And we'd probably all be wearing wool caps on a Sunday. Instead, in 2020, we have new rules around another item of clothing, the face mask which in certain cases you can get arrested for not wearing. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to listen to Fashioned only on Audible, out now.